Welcome to the first ever edition of the Locked On Longhorns reveal of our mock Big 12 preseason poll and our mock Big 12 preseason honors. Grab some snacks, some light refreshments, get comfortable. Enjoy the show. You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked on. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on today to get started. On today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, we're doing our first ever Big 12 mock preseason poll as well as our mock preseason honors in the first segment i'm ranking each team in the conference this year first through 14th in the second segment i'm going through all of the major awards as well as the first and second team letting you know which texas players i think will be recognized at the end of the season and last but not least as a thank you for helping me get to 3,000 youtube subscribers i'm reading some of your youtube comments on the show and if you're reading the ticker on the bottom of the screen, you see that we have 71 days until Texas plays Rice. I think I counted that right. If I didn't, let me know in the comments. Also, we're on a quest to 4,000 YouTube subscribers. The grind never stops. So if you could like or subscribe, it is greatly appreciated. Once again, in this first segment that's starting right now, I am ranking each team 1 through 14 in our first annual Big 12 mock preseason poll. Of course, this will be the last one because we're headed to the SEC, but I see no reason why I can't continue to do this every year once we get to the best conference in college football. Also, I'm saying mock because I am not a Big 12 media member yet, all right? So I know that either today or yesterday was their last day to submit their uh, you know, official preseason poll and preseason honors. I am not submitting anything official because it's not official, right? I have nowhere to submit it to. I'm just talking trash on the podcast, right? So I want to make that very clear that these aren't official picks, right? So, you know, because of that, you have the ability to see all of my picks and react to them, right? So whether you want to tell me I'm crazy in the comments, whether you agree with me, whether you want to screenshot them or bookmark them and come back in six months and tell me how stupid I was, I welcome all engagement. So feel free. Here we go. Without further ado, my number one team on the list heading into the Big 12 this year in the mock locked on Longhorns preseason poll is your Texas Longhorns. And I know it's going to sound like I'm biased, right? You know, I host Locked On Longhorns. Of course, I think Texas will be the best team in the Big 12, but I think every media member should have Texas at the top of their list. And I know some people will say, well, you know, it's Texas. They could be talented every year and they never win the Big 12. That's cool. You're right. Like, unfortunately, you're right. But that has no bearing on the 2023 season. And I just think this is the year for Texas. You know, like Steve Sarkeesian said, on the pivot interview, this feels like my team, right? And when you bring back 10 of 11 starters, of course, the one you're missing is B. John Robinson. That's huge, you know, but you bring back every starter on your offensive line. Quinn Ewers in year two should be better. JT Sanders, a top three player at his position. You have a top two wide receiver room in the country. Steve Sarkeesian pulling the strings. The offense should be very explosive. On the defensive side of the ball, you're bringing back five starters, even more rotation pieces on that side of the ball. You have so much continuity from year one to year three on this coaching staff. And there isn't a dominant team or a dominant contender to Texas this year in the conference. It feels like this just has to be the year that Texas gets over the hump. They should be the favorites going into the season. Of course, you have to play the games, but I think even after they play the games, they'll be the last team standing in the conference this season. Number two, Kansas State. And Kansas State was the Big 12 champions last year. You can make the argument that if they don't lose to Tulane, now that wasn't a bad loss because we saw Tulane beat USC at the end of the season, right? But you make the argument they don't lose to Tulane and they beat TCU in the Big 12 championship game. It might be Kansas State in the college football playoff instead of TCU, right? That's how much losing to Tulane can affect your season, I guess, right? But, you know, this is a really talented football team. They bring back Will Howard, who's going to be one of the best quarterbacks in the conference. Probably should have started for them over Adrian Martinez from day one. They lost Deuce Vaughn, who was a hell of a running back. I'm glad I get to root for him as a Dallas Cowboy now, but they brought in a transfer running back from Florida State, who I think will be one of the best four running backs in the conference this year. will make first or second team all Big 12 because he's running behind the best offensive line in the conference, led by Cooper Beebe, who won Big 12 Offensive Lineman of the Year last year. And that's a huge accomplishment when he was going against Kelvin Banks as a true freshman left tackle. On the defensive side of the ball, they lost the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year 
His name is Felix. I'm not even going to try to butcher his last name. He shouldn't have won the award anyway <laughs> over Jalen Ford, so it doesn't matter. And then Julius Brents, uh, one of the best corners in college football last year, one of the biggest corners in college football last year. I think he's 6'4", right? So he should be playing receiver. He probably can't catch. But nonetheless, you know, we know that Chris Kleiman is one of the best coaches in college football. This is a very disciplined team. I expect that defense will be a very competent unit this year. I think Kansas State will be really good, probably the best contender to Texas for the Big 12 championship this season, even though they have not beaten Texas since the 27th. 17 season that looks like a favorable likely preseason matchup in Arlington at the end of the season number three Oklahoma and if this was in the SEC I probably would have Oklahoma a lot lower right but I think we're overstating Oklahoma's downfall right they are in a rebuild right now but this isn't a dominant big 12 right even Texas who is at the top of the list right we have to take a wait and see approach with Texas right Kansas State they were the best team in the Big 12 last year, but they lost a lot of talent. Even though we expect them to be really good, they lost their three best players, right? So Oklahoma is at number three, but there's no definitive, oh, yeah, like this is a Lincoln Riley's Oklahoma team, right? Or this is, you know, one of those Gary Patterson TCU teams, right? Even as talented as Texas is, this is still a wide open conference. And I think Oklahoma is still very talented. You brought in, uh, you know, Jackson Arnold to supplement Dylan Gabriel in case he goes down because we saw the debacle um, in the Red River rivalry. They have a lot of talent on the offensive side of the ball. Of course, they don't have, you know, Texas level of talent, but I do think they have some really nice pieces in the running back room and in the wide receiver room. It'll, re you know, it remains to be seen how they'll put it all together in Jeff Levy's second year. And that defense was just really uncharacteristic for Brent Venables last year, you know, most of it was because Alex Grinch and Lincoln Riley left the cupboard bare. And it's just hard to, you know, try to come in and fix everything in one season. But they did a really good job in terms of their recruiting class. I think top five in the country. And they did a really good job in terms of their transfer class, which I believe was top five in the country as well. To me, I see a lot of similarities between year two Texas and year two Oklahoma under Brent Venables, right, where they started off year one it did not meet expectations but then year two they had a strong recruiting class a strong transfer class and i could see them making that jump to eight to nine wins also when you look at their schedule the only two teams that should be favored over them are tcu and texas and by the time oklahoma plays tcu i think oklahoma will be better than tcu so i just think we're overstating their downfall a little bit if this was the sec i would have them at six or seventh but in the big 12 i still think they win eight or nine games this year and that's good enough to make them the third best team in the conference when you look at texas tech at number four i really like what joey mcguire is building there i think they finally have some clarity at the quarterback position last year they had three quarterbacks now it seems like tyler shuck is locked in as the starter and you know i think that they have a really good culture right you know this is a team that as you know we felt like texas made a jump last year from five and seven well texas tech beat us and had the exact same record so you can make an argument that texas tech had a better season than texas last year the problem is it's just hard to take that next step, right? It's hard to go from a 7-8 win program to a 10 or 11 win program. And that's what would be next for Texas Tech. And I'm just not sure if they have the talent on their roster to do that, right? I think they're in that perfect spot right now where they're 8-4 and four and, you know, every game they play is going to be a tough matchup. But when you look at their schedule, they have to play Oregon. They have to play Texas. And I believe they play Oklahoma. That's three games they should lose already. That puts your ceiling at nine and three. And I'm not sure Texas Tech is good enough to not slip up anywhere else on their schedule outside of that. So, you know, I like what Joey McGuire is building. I think this is going to be a dominant program in the new Big 12. But as of this year, I'm just not sure they take that next step from eight wins to 10 wins. And that's why I think they're still kind of in that, you know, middle of the top range in the Big 12 at number four. Five is TCU. And, you know, they're a tough team to gauge, right? Because I think the obvious argument is that, oh, OK, well, they're not going to go 12 and 0 like they did last year. A lot of those were Gary Patterson's players. And when you lose Max Duggan, you know, Quentin Johnson, Hodges Tomlinson, Kendra Miller, the list goes on and on. You know, it's likely that you're not going to be as good as you were this season before. But I think they brought in some really good players in the transfer portal. They turned into Alabama West, bringing in Trey Sanders, Tommy Brockemeyer and Jojo Earl. They should be really good at TCU. They also brought in a really good recruiting class for TCU. And I think Sonny Dykes is a hell of a coach. So I expect TCU to be good this year. But, you know, obviously when you're falling from 12 and 0 in the national championship game, that's a big fall. So even if they go seven and five, eight and five this season, that's four less losses than you had. You know, that's four more losses or four less wins than you had last, se last season. Nothing about TCU's roster scares me right now. That's why I have them as the fifth best team in the Big 12. All although I do think they'll beat Colorado pretty bad in week one. 
At six, I have Baylor. And I think I'm probably higher on Baylor than a lot of people. This is probably where people start to really disagree with me, right? But when you look at Blake Shapin, I think he's going to take the next step next year. And he's going to be a lot better. And there's a lot of comparisons from Blake Shapin and Quinn Ewers to me, right? They were both really talented players who made a lot of, you know, true freshman or racial freshman mistakes last year. Now, of course, Quinn Ewers has a lot more talent around him. He's in a better offensive system and he has more natural talent based on his recruiting ranking. Right. So I'm not saying that Blake Shapin and Quinn Ewers are going to have identical seasons. But if we have all the faith in the world that Quinn Ewers is going to be a lot better, then I think we have to have some faith that Blake Shapin in year two is going to be better as well. Also, Richard Reese might be the best running back in college football we've seen under Dave Aranda, they've always been really good in the trenches on the offensive line. And I know they don't have the talent they had, you know, on the defensive side of the ball, but I expect the Dave Aranda defense to be sound and be really good. I think this is a team that's not going to make noise at the top of the Big 12. They're not going to make it to the Big 12 championship game. But week in and week out, Baylor is a threat to beat anybody in this conference and spoil their season. Number seven, I got Iowa State. And I wanted to put Iowa State at number six, but there's this rumor floating around. And my philosophy on rumors is if I see it once, whatever. If I start to see it two, three times, there might be some smoke there. And there's some real smoke around Hunter Deckers having to miss some games or the entire season based on him gambling. I don't know what he was gambling on, where he was gambling, but that's just the rumor. You know, maybe I'm on Twitter too much. Maybe it's messing with my head, but I've seen it enough times to let you know if you haven't seen it, there's some real smoke there. So I don't know what's going on with Hunter Deckers, but... If Hunter Deckers does play, I think Iowa State will be competent on the offensive side of the ball. That was their downfall last year. They lost, I think, seven or eight games, but pretty much all of their losses were by one score. You expect that to regress to the mean a little bit. And we know Iowa State is going to be really good on the defensive side of the ball. Matt Campbell, one of the best coaches in college football, not in terms of bringing in talent and recruiting, but just working with what you have. Matt Campbell is one of the best in the business. I expect Iowa State to be in the top half of the conference this season. But once again, that's, you know, pending Hunter Deckers not being being suspended for gambling this season BYU at number eight this is where we start to get into the new big 12 and you know I think that BYU is just a very respectable program you know we played BYU this year I think you know obviously Sark who went there and played football there will be you know hyped up for that game and I think we'll you know play BYU really well but this is just a program that's respectable every year and I don't see the top end talent on this team this year to put them at the top of the big 12 but this is also a program that won't be at the bottom of the big 12 by any means so i got them squarely in the middle i think they'll win some games they shouldn't win and they'll lose some games they shouldn't lose right that's just where byu is and number nine i got kansas and a lot of people are a lot higher on kansas than i am i just don't get it you know i know they started off five and oh last year but then i think they ended up six and six you know right and and went to a bowl game and you know i know jalen daniels you know has a lot of people excited but we went to kansas and he was a non-factor i know it was his first game coming off an injury but we went to kansas and that game was over by halfway through the first quarter you know i'm just not convinced that kansas is going to take that next step like i said it's hard right and kansas is a two to three win program that's just what they are and they've taken that next step to a five six win program which is really good But you're not going to convince me that they're going to take another step to be in an eight to nine win program. That's just not how it works. Right. Especially when you can't recruit at a high level. And as good as Kansas is, they can't recruit at a high level. So I think six to seven wins is their ceiling. If they do that again, then I think me ranking them at nine, maybe it'll be a little bit too low. But it's not crazy. But like I said, I just don't see Kansas taking that next step like everybody else does. I have a lot of respect for Jalen Daniels, have a lot of respect for their coach. But you need a lot more than that to compete in a power five conference. I'm just not sure Kansas has it. So I got them as the ninth best team in the Big 12. 10, UCF. I don't know a bunch about them. I know they've recruited semi-well to be UCF. I also know their quarterback plays football and baseball. He's a hell of an athlete. So I'm going to slot them in at 10 just based on that. Number 11, Oklahoma State. So I was looking at, I think it was Joe Cook's list on Inside Texas, and he had Oklahoma State in the top five. And he had a really good reasoning for having Oklahoma State in the top five. They have a really favorable schedule, like a crazy favorable schedule in the new Big 12. They play all four of the new teams and they don't play Texas Tech, TCU or Texas, I think. Like they have a crazy easy schedule, right? But when I look at what happened this offseason with Oklahoma State, where they're losing their quarterback that's been there six years, they're losing their defensive coordinator saying he wants to take a year away from football. They're losing starting linebackers to their biggest rival in Oklahoma, Like, I know that, you know what I mean? It just felt like 
there's a huge culture problem going on in Oklahoma State, and Mike Gundy's days are numbered. I know you can never count out Oklahoma State. I know somehow they always seem to win more games than they should, and they do have a very favorable schedule this year. But it just feels like they have really bad internal issues at Oklahoma State that are going to linger over them this season. I don't anticipate seeing Oklahoma State at the top of the Big 12. They might have a few shiny moments, but I think this is going to be one of the worst teams in the conference. Cincinnati don't have much to say about them, but that run of them going to the college football playoff and being a really good team was headlined by a coach who's no longer there and personnel who's no longer there. I think at least in this first year, they're at the bottom of the Big 12. Houston at number 13, I have a lot of respect for Dana Holgerson. I think they have some intriguing pieces at the wide receiver position, but you lost Tank Dale to the uh, Texans. Excuse me, you lost Clayton Toon to wherever he went, and you lost your starting running back to Dion in Colorado. So, you know, I think that they have some talent on that roster, but it's not enough to compete in the first year in the Big 12. That's why I have them at 13. And West Virginia at 14. Most people would have Houston at 13, but uh, I mean, Houston at 14, but I think West Virginia is just a dead football program right now. Like, really. I think Neil Brown is you know walking around you know just waiting to be fired and i just don't see a scenario in which they can win a bunch of games this season right you know so i think that west virginia is a dying football program at least right now i think neil brown is on the way out and i think players and the coaches staff know that right and i think when everybody knows that your coach is probably one bad performance away from being fired it's just hard to get up and play your best football especially if neil brown is not doing a good job of getting them ready to play in the first place so like I said, I just think this is a dying football program, at least right now. Right. And I don't see the West Virginia Mountaineers playing a ton of inspired football this season, not to mention they have a crazy tough schedule this year. So that is my mock Big 12 preseason poll. I have Texas at the top, West Virginia at the bottom. Let me know what you think. Did I get it right? Did I get it wrong? Do I have some schools too high? Do I have some schools too low? Let me know in the comments. Quick word from our sponsors, and then we're going into our second segment, which Texas players have a chance to win some of the major awards or land on the first or second team all-conference list this season. Usually giving you the scouting report on Bird Dogs. Excuse me. Usually giving you the scouting report on Texas football. I have given you the scouting report on Bird Dogs, and I'm here to do it again today because Bird Dogs make you look good. The stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, and y'all love Lululemon, but they fit way better. They is Bird Dogs. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement bird dogs use anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long you know you need that in this 115 degree weather at least that's what it feels like in texas right now my lord go to birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free yeti style tumbler with your order that's birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free yeti style tumbler you won't want to take your bird dogs off we promise you until you get in the house in this 115 degree weather but when you're outside you won't want to take them off you shouldn't take them off that's indecent exposure go get your bird dogs right now <laughs> all right so the second part of our mock uh you know big 12 preseason honors and poll once again i am not a big 12 media member so i have to say mock i don't want anybody to get the impression that these are real picks and i submitted them to anybody once again even if i did submit them to anybody they won't get you know they'll probably get dismissed you know, as soon as i submit them to them so we're going through the Big 12 honors this year, and if I think Texas is going to be the best team in the Big 12, if I think Texas has the most talent in the Big 12, then I think Texas has a really good chance to win some of these awards. So I'm going to go through each major award in the Big 12, as well as the first and second team, and tell you which players I think should end up getting recognized at the end of the season. So we're going to start with the first award, which is the Offensive Player of the Year. And I think at the end of the year, Quinn Ewers will be the Big 12 Offensive Player of the Year. When you look at it last year, B. John Robinson was the best player in the Big 12, but they gave it to Max Duggan because they were undefeated. He was a Heisman candidate and he had the most team success, right? B. John Robinson was the best offensive player in the country. I mean, and well, he was one of the best in the country, but he was the best in the conference, bar none. But they gave it to Max Duggan based on team success. I think Quinn Ewers will be the starting quarterback for the best team in the conference he'll also have some really gaudy numbers which i think will put him in the top five Heisman voting at the end of the season so i think it's a no-brainer the starting quarterback with gaudy numbers on the best team in the big 12 should and will win offensive player of the year this season 
defensive player of the year, Jalen Ford will win it. And it's going to be one of those crazy anomalies where he's going to win it in a season in which his stats weren't as good in the season he got snubbed, right? Because last year he had 100 tackles, like four sacks, four forced fumbles, like two interceptions. He had a crazy stat line, right? He's not going to do that again this year. I think he can get back to 100 tackles. But as far as the sacks, forced fumbles, and interceptions, it's going to be hard to replicate that, right? But Texas is going to be better as a team. Texas is going to be better as a defensive unit. And because of that, Jalen Ford is going to get the recognition he deserves this year. Once again, he will not have the same stat line he had last year, I believe. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Let me knock on wood. That's not me saying he's going to be worse. It's just going to be hard to put up that elite stat line he put up last season. But he's going to win Defensive Player of the Year, rightfully so, this year, even though he's going to have a better stat line last year than the one he will produce this season. It's crazy how that works, you know, but it just happens sometimes like that. Offensive newcomer of the year. Not sure if A.D. Mitchell will win this, but he's the best player on Texas roster that has a chance to win this award. I think when you look at, you know, the potential of this offense this season, you're looking at a team that could have two a thousand yard receivers. Right. And if A.D. Mitchell has a thousand yards and let's say eight to 10, 10 plus touchdowns next to Xavier, where the in an explosive offense on the best team in the Big 12, it'll be hard to make an argument for anyone else other than A.D. Mitchell for offensive newcomers. So not saying he will win it. I do think Quinn Ewers and Jalen Ford will win Offensive and Defensive Player of the Year. I could see A.D. Mitchell winning Offensive Newcomer. Defensive Newcomer, I don't have anybody for that award. I don't think there's a Texas player that will win that award. Now, you could say maybe Jalen Catalan, but I just don't see a scenario in which he's going to play 12 games, right? I'm not going to sit here and say to you all that he's going to do something that he has not done in two years, right? And I also think they'll manage him, right? They're going to rotate a lot of safeties, right, in that position. And with Jaron Thompson, they did it last year. But I think they're going to kind of manage Jalen Catalan through the season as well and not give him, you know, more snaps than he can handle or just put him out there and say, go crazy until you get injured. So because because of that, I don't think he can have the season that will make him defensive newcomer of the year. But if I had to pick a player from the Texas roster, of course, Jalen Catalan, a former all SEC safety, would be the most likely candidate for that position. Offensive freshman, I think Cedric Baxter and Jonte Cook are the two best offensive freshmen in the Big 12 this year. But I think neither one of them win the award because we don't need them to. Right. If we were putting Cedric Baxter or Jonte Cook in a position to really shine this year, then I think they would win the award. No question. But when you look at Cedric Baxter he at least right now is your third string running back right behind Jaden Blue and Jonathan Brooks when you look at John T. Cook at least right now he's your fourth string wide receiver if he's ahead of Isaiah Nayor and I don't even think that's the case right so I think Cedric Baxter and John T. Cook are the best two offensive freshmen in the conference but will they get the opportunity to showcase it this year probably not so I don't think either one of them wins the award defensive freshman of the year I think it's going to be Anthony Hill and right now he's not starting. He's behind David Bender. And so he would be in in a rotational role. But I think even in a rotational role, he would be able to do enough to compete for the award. But I honestly think by the time we get into conference play, your starting linebacker is going to be Jalen Ford and Anthony Hill. I just think that the only reason there's no disrespect to David Bender. I think he's a hell of a player. But I think the only reason he's over Anthony Hill right now is because of experience. And we have this thing where we don't want to give, you know, we don't want to just throw the world at true freshmen, even though we had to do it with Kelvin Banks last year. And I get that, right? That's best case scenario for your football team. But I just don't see a scenario in which 13, 14 games this year, Anthony Hill is starting the game on the sideline. Like I said, by the time we get to conference play, I think he's your starting linebacker, which would make him the heavy favorite for defensive freshman of the year in the Big 12. Offensive lineman of the year, it's going to be hard to pry that away from Cooper Beebe. He won it last year and not sure what he could do to lose the award, right? But I think if Texas has the best team in the conference, if they have an explosive passing offense, one of the biggest reasons for that has to be your blind side protector in left tackle, Kelvin Banks. So this award is either going to come down to, I'm telling you right now, it's either going to come down to Kelvin Banks or Cooper Beebe. I could see a scenario in which Cooper Beebe wins it again, but if Texas has the team success and is the overwhelming best team in the Big 12, then that could give Kelvin Banks the push he needs to be the offensive lineman of the year. Defensive lineman of the year, I think Tavondre Sweat is our best defensive lineman, but this is a award that's going to go to somebody that has counting stats, right? So it's going to go to an edge where you can say he had this many sacks, right? As we saw last year with Kansas State and their edge rusher. And so I think Baron Terrell is going to have seven and a half, eight plus sacks this year. And that's going to give him, you know, the push he needs to at least be a candidate for defensive lineman of the year in the Big 12, not saying he'll win it. And then last but not least, coach of the year is going to go to Steve Sarkeesian like he went to Sonny Dykes last year. If you're the best team 
in the Big 12. If this is the year that Texas gets over the hump, then Steve Sarkeesian winning coach of the year at the conference will be a no brainer. Now we're going to go through the first team and the second team, and I'll let you know which players I think will end up on one of those rosters at the end of the season. If I think Quinn Ewers is going to be the offensive player of the year, then I think, of course, he's going to be the first team all Big 12 quarterback. There's only one quarterback that makes all Big 12 first team. I think it'll be Quinn Ewers. There's three all Big 12 first team receivers. I think Xavier Worthy will be one of those three. If we have the offensive season we think we'll have, there's no question in my mind Xavier Worthy will be one of the three best wide receivers in the conference. Last year, JT Sanders was your first team all Big 12. There's only one of them. I anticipate that this year he will be the best tight end in the Big 12 as well. Kelvin Banks, he did not make first team last year. He made second team. That was a mistake this year. He will make first team all Big 12 as the starting left tackle. There's five spots. He will be one of them. Five defensive lineman spots. I don't think Texas had a first team all Big 12 D lineman last year. They will this year into Vondre Sweat. He will get one of those five spots. Jalen Ford will be a first team all Big 12 linebacker for the second year in a row. I said he will win Big 12 defensive player of the year, which would solidify him that spot. But you know, even if he gets snubbed again, he will be one of the best three linebackers in the conference this year. I'm pretty comfortable in saying that. In terms of DB, this one was hard because I think all of our DBs have a chance to make first team all Big 12, but I tried to be realistic. And so I said, okay, if there's only five spots in 14 teams, which player on the Texas roster at the DB position has the best chance to make first team all Big 12? And I went with Jade Barron because he's going to be playing in that nickel star spot. And we saw last year he rushed the quarterback a lot. He did a lot of different things, you know, made tackles in the backfield. So he's going to have a stat line that looks more similar to a linebacker than a DB, right? Because you're going to see sacks on his stat line. You're going to see tackles for loss on his stat line. He's going to play all over the field. I think that's going to give him the stat line he needs to make first team all Big 12 coupled with Texas team success. All Big 12 second team, I got Jonathan Brooks making the second team, right? And I think that's just because Texas is going to be so explosive in the passing game and on offense. I think Jonathan Brooks will get a thousand yards, but I think Richard Reese and maybe one other running back will have to have a bigger role on their football team. And stats wise, they'll make, uh, you know, the first team, but second team, I think Jonathan Brooks, uh, even though he's going to be in a running back timeshare, will get a thousand yards. We'll be on the best team in the big 12. That should be good enough for second team Four running backs total, make it two on the first team, two on the second team. Hard pressed for me to believe that five running backs will be better than Jonathan Brooks this season or four running backs. I should say A.D. Mitchell. I got him on second team. He very well could make first team. But like I said, it have to be realistic and not just put every Texas player on the first team. So I think, you know, if six wide receivers get recognized in the conference this year, A.D. Mitchell should be one of those six. He makes the second team. Kristen Jones. I'm going to say if 10 offensive linemen in the Big 12 get recognized, then at least two Texas players should be in that top 10. We know Kelvin Banks will be in the top five. First team, no question. I'm going to step out on a limb and say Kristen Jones makes that second team. He's one of the 10 best offensive linemen in the conference this year. And really, that doesn't even feel like stepping out on a limb because he was really good last year. Byron Murphy and Baron Sorrell, I think they both make the second team in terms of all Big 12 defensive linemen, right? So if there's 10 of them total, five on the first team, five on the second team, I got Tavondre Sweat number one on the first team. And then I got Byron Murphy and Baron Sorrell on the second team. I think all three of those players will occupy 10 spots in terms of the first and second team defensive linemen for the all Big 12 teams. And then in terms of DB on the second team, I got Ryan Watts and Jaron Thompson. So out of the 10 DBs recognized in the conference this year, I think three of them will be Texas Longhorns, Jade Barron, Ryan Watts, and Jaron Thompson. And the most likely to get snubbed from one of these teams, I think the obvious answer is Jordan Whittington because he's one of the best wide receivers in the country. But he's the third best wide receiver on our team, also next to JT Sanders, also next to a very talented wide receiver room. So I just don't see a scenario in which he has a stat line that makes him one of the six best wide receivers in the Big 12 this season, even though he's one of the six best wide receivers in the Big 12 coming into the season. So those are my uh, Big 12 honors, my mock Big 12 honors, I should say, as well as my mock all Big 12 first team and mock all Big 12 second team in terms of your Texas Longhorn football team. If they have the season we think they should have, then they should occupy as many lists and as many, you know, uh, or they should occupy the Big 12 first team, Big 12 second team list and as many awards as I just mentioned, because we saw last year that TCU was celebrated and awarded a lot in terms of the conference honors for team success. If Texas has that team success with the level of talent they have, then they should flood those first and second team lists and most of the Big 12 awards this season. A quick word from our sponsors, and I'm going to read some of your crazy YouTube comments on the show.
All right, so getting into some of your, some of your comments. This is funny. This is from my line brother. Uh, this is great, John, and you definitely convinced me to get some bird dogs. Thank you. All right, he tapped into the show when I got 3,000 YouTube subscribers. He's not a Texas fan, actually a USC fan. I guess he's from LA, so appreciate him watching. Appreciate him talking a little trash, and you know, go get you some bird dogs. Like I said, you won't want to take them off. Second comment, as an LSU fan, I was a little surprised that we didn't get Texas at home for 2024, especially since we missed out on that game because of the 2020 COVID season. I think we'll get that one in 2025, though. I would anticipate that as well. That would be a good up and coming rivalry. Great video, man. Thank you. Keep it up and welcome to the SEC. So I did a segment talking about how Oklahoma got a tougher schedule than Texas. If I'm ranking the top five programs in the SEC right now, it would have to be Georgia, Alabama, LSU, Tennessee, and then Ole Miss. Oklahoma plays four of those schools this year. Texas only plays one, and that's Georgia. So we do play the top dog, but I'd rather play one, the best school in that five, than play the other four. All right. I think that adds up. So I'm glad we don't play LSU this year because with Michigan on the schedule, Oklahoma on the schedule uh, at, you know, uh, Arkansas at Texas A&M at. Uh, I already said Michigan. I, I mentioned all the the, the the tough teams we play. Nonetheless. Right. Adding LSU to that would be murderers row. So I'm glad we don't play LSU in 2024, but definitely looking forward to that game in 2025 and looking forward to that being a rivalry, you know, kind of renewed in the SEC, hopefully year in and year out. Because I think that game, whether it's in Austin or whether it's in, you know, Death Valley, um, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, a really good game for everybody for sure. It's going to be a really fun game every year. Uh, let's see. It's going to be a tough first year for Texas in the SEC. I do think they will make the college football playoff because a lot of work is being put in to rebuild that program to its former prominence under Mac Brown as head coach. Texas versus Michigan and Oklahoma will be tough games as well as the Georgia Bulldogs. The Red River Shootout is one of my favorite big games in college ball. I agree. And glad we get to add uh, the Lone Star Showdown back to that. If somebody can come up with a name for the Texas Arkansas game, that would be great uh, because that's going to be a perennial rivalry as well. It's going to be a very tough matchup between two fan bases if they don't hate each other right now they will <laughs> by the time texas is three four years into the sec every road game is a big deal in the sec back-to-back -back road games are brutal except vandy and missouri i think even you know vandy and missouri can be tough as florida last year you know anthony richardson top five pick in the draft couldn't beat vanderbilt last year but he's going to be really good for the Colts, right? <laughs> the physical play week in and week out takes its toll. So when you look at some teams and say that's a win, be careful because the SEC is much different than the Big 12. But Texas and Oklahoma are great additions and make the SEC better from one big orange fan to the other. Welcome. I will say SEC fans are amazing. They're all in my comments saying welcome. You know, I'm not sure if that'll, you know, they'll keep that same energy when we get there, but they've been really nice thus far. You know, I have to say, you know, you're right. Every game in the uh, SEC is going to be tough, but I think every game in Power 5 college football is tough, right? Some schools just make it look easy, and Texas is not one of those schools, right? The last 10 years we've seen that you can't take anything for granted in the Big 12, so I definitely don't think Texas fans will take anything for granted heading into the SEC. I did say in 2024, Texas should absolutely not lose to uh, – Mississippi State, they should not lose to Kentucky and they should not lose to Vanderbilt. Now, if they do, I'll say, I guess you just got to chalk that up to the SEC, but I'm comfortable in saying my favorite football team should be better than those teams, even in the SEC. One more. Jonathan, you bring up the question I have had all along regarding this move to the SEC. It makes no sense to me. I don't understand the need to go into that murderous conference trying to win a national championship. Why not stay in the Big 12, win that conference, and then play one Big 10 and one SEC team for a national championship? I'm just confused. Now, this does make a lot of sense, right? It would make more sense to stay in the Big 12 where you have the path of least resistance trying to uh, get to a college football playoff and a national championship. But one, I think because of the 12 uh, team college football playoff, that's pretty much a mute point. I've said I think that at least three or four teams in the SEC will make the college football playoff every year when they expand to 12. And I think if Texas can't be one of the three or four best teams in the SEC, then they're not on the level as a program that we think they are. Right. Because every year Texas brings in uh talent on the level of georgia and alabama so why can't they win on the level of georgia and alabama that's why i'm not concerned about them going to the sec because they recruit like the top teams in the sec it's about getting over the hump and actually you know that translating on the field secondly i think it's for the fans right it's so much more of a fan experience and enjoyment when you look at the games we'll be playing in on the road and in dkr it's just a way better experience than the games we're being accustomed 
we've been accustomed to playing in the Big 12. So from a fan experience, I'd rather play, you know, against Georgia in DKR and rather play against Florida in DKR. I'd rather go to LSU and go to Florida and go to Tennessee, go to Auburn and go to Alabama, then play against TCU. Baylor, go to Kansas State, go to Iowa State and Ames, Iowa. And that's no disrespect for these schools, but that's why they say in the SEC, it just means more. And it does, right? These are just better destinations. These are better home games. So I think for the better fan experience, it makes a lot of sense to go to the SEC. I think these are the best games in college football. And Texas is one of the premier programs in the sport. They should be playing football at the highest level. And like I said, going to the SEC does not scare me or does not concern me because Texas brings in talent on the level of Georgia and Alabama. And hopefully under Steve Sarkeesian, they'll start winning at the level that Georgia and Alabama do. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked on Longhorns, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hook them. Peace.